um, imagine you are already amongst the olive trees and you're listening to them whispering. Maybe you still have a little bit of energy left to focus and maybe it, the, the whispering of the trees actually makes some sense. Um, so I'll start with conclusions. So I'm going to talk about um, biopolitics of refugee healthcare, particularly refugee healthcare in German initial reception centers. Um, I think it's, it's the first time ever that I actually consider this or talk about this as a project. It's been an idea um, and it's at a very, very early stage. So you can say I'm still in the process of assembling the problem and raising questions um, finding lines of um, inquiry that might be interesting. But as a starting point, um, these three very general questions can maybe um, help to anchor the discussion. So the first, the things that I'm interested in is in what ways is refugee healthcare political? That is, how is it entangled with discourses on rights, um, on belonging, on deservingness, um, and so on. The second question related to that is how does refugee healthcare actually function in different settings, in complete places and practice settings? Um, and particularly, what is the role of health professionals, um, of doctors, in these contexts? Because they, they, they provide an interface between public institutions, state institutions, um, and uh, refugees in uh, different places. So given the early stage of my thinking about this, I'm not trying to answer these questions, um, but rather I try and map the field and consider how assembly thinking may be useful um, to think about this. The anchor point for my um, considerations that are more on the theoretical and conceptual side um, are, as I said, initial reception centers in Germany. Uh, in particular, the initial reception center in Freiburg. Initial reception center, the Germans have a very nice bureaucratic term for it, Erstaufnahmeeinrichtung. Um, these are the places where refugees who actually make it across the European border regime make their first encounter with um, the, the German state. So that's where they go and then um, can apply, can register, and can apply for asylum. So, on the one hand, this is a place where they first become visible as an individual to the state. Um, and on the other hand, they still remain largely separated from the majority society and have only limited access to public services, including healthcare. So, let's start by saying a few words on the initial reception center in Freiburg and how medical care, what role healthcare plays in this context, um, and then consider how. I can possibly use by um, assemblage theory to sort of come to a bit more nuanced version of biopolitics and help understand what is happening in these places. So refugees that um, arrive in Germany are distributed amongst the different um, states and brought to these initial reception centers. Um, and in these centers, as I said, they are registered and can then apply for asylum. In theory, people are meant to stay there for about six weeks. Um, in reality, they often stay there for several months, uh, sometimes up to a year or even more. The centers usually have the form of a camp, um, and this is an image of the initial reception center in Freiburg. So you see that the compound is um, fenced and guarded, so there's security personnel um, standing at the, at the front entrance gate. Uh, but people are allowed to leave that compound and move, at least to some extent, um, around the city. The tent on the, um, the large tent here on the left, on the back, is um, there's some common spaces here, uh, including catering, and the, the large tents on the right are the places where people actually sleep with very limited um, privacy, obviously. So the, the landlord of this camp is the state of Baden-Württemberg, <coughs> and the center is operated by European Home Care, which is a private company. In addition, there's private security personnel and catering, um, also all um, private companies paid by the state. 
you, so you also see these two rows of containers here, um, and the, the front row are some administration, social service offices, and the back row is actually a small polyclinic organized by the university clinic in Freiburg. Um, and it's a project that has been initi initiated by the university clinic um, and is now supported by the state. Um, and on several days a week, they offer consultations for refugees there in general medicine, but also in specialized fields um, such as pediatrics, infectiology, gynecology, and also psychotherapy, uh, which is relatively rare if you um, compare that to other places. And it's kind of become a role model for how refugee healthcare could be organized. So while the form of the, the center is that of a camp, and it's been called a camp, and also criticized legitimately, I would say, um, for, for excluding people, um, I would still say it's not a, a camp in, an, in, in the sense of a government. It's not a state of exception where people are actually reduced to bare life. It's true that life is administered and, and governed in particular ways and different from um, the majority of society. Um, it's, it's valued differently, governed differently. Um, it's an exceptional situation, but it's not a state of exception in that narrow sense. People appear here first as subjects with certain rights um, and needs uh, and so forth. So in this situation, the medical condition of refugees um, is part of the politics of population, becomes part of the politics of population in several respects. So for one, um, there's a mandatory health screening and vaccination organizing, organized by the health um, authorities and that, of course, is motivated, um, of course, motivated by concern that um, refugees might actually bring in infectious diseases and pose a risk to um, the majority society. Then the body condition, the health condition, can um, mean a provision to deport, in some cases, of severe illness. Um, so here, health to some extent interferes with the logics of the um, of the security state. Health can be relevant to the asylum process. So, if, for example, if you, if there are um, signs of torture, of post-traumatic stress disorder, or things like that. This can be an indication that people were um, uh, treated um, in the place where they come from, an indicator for that they actually have a right to asylum. And then finally, um, they have the right to healthcare, but that right is restricted um, by federal law. So they are granted some treatments, but not um, to the same extent than uh, the general um, population in Germany. So what this indicates is that the practice of medical care and the work of health professionals is situated at um, a point where different logics overlap and sometimes um, interfere or conflict. So there's state logics of inclusion and exclusion. Um, there are medical ethics um, that play a role in how people interact. Um, humanitarianism and human rights concerns um, are the, the thing. And then, of course, also economic considerations. Um, who pays um, for what exactly and so forth. And the question how these logics and operate and are balanced in different contexts is one thing that, that I'd be interested in. So, um, for example, I already said that this example of Freiburg is to some extent particular. Um, it, healthcare is offered on site and is organized by the university clinic, so people can go and see doctors during consultation hours. Whereas in other places, um, refugees first have to get a voucher, and they get that voucher by the social authority. So there's a bureaucrat actually that has to decide whether a request to see a doctor is legitimate or not which of course they're usually or often not qualified to do. And with that voucher then they go to a clinic um, somewhere in the city or practice. So, a um, few words on biopolitics and the question then how assemblage thinking can help to grasp um, maybe what is happening there. Foucault uses the term biopolitics to um, highlight how over the course of the from the 19th or 20th century, the population um, becomes a target of state intervention and regulation. But this regulation is concerned with aggregate biological phenomena. Um, 
and with the individual body less, or only so far as the individual body is an element of an aggregate, birth rates, death rates, and so forth. Um, what he calls biological, uh, I, I think, would now be more closely um, identified with public health. Um, really. So he says this, this, the series that he identifies here is the population, um, and the regulation focuses on biological processes, and it's a matter of state. And he says that apart from early forms of biopower that focus more on disciplining and on individual bodies, um, and distinguishes this second series here, which focus on body, on the organism as sort of the biology of the body, um, discipline, and um, institutions. Generally, discussions on biopolitics um, often revolve around relatively large themes or extremes um, and scales. So it's about the organization of life and death, um, the state or of society or capitalism. Um, in general, it changes over time spans of decades or even centuries. And part of what I would like to do is try and situate it in actual practices of refugee healthcare in these centers without losing sight of the um, larger context in which it takes place. And Foucault, to some extent, already helps here because he does not see these two series in strict opposition, but actually functioning um, together. And he particularly points to medicine as the link between the two when he writes, medicine is a power knowledge that can be applied to both the body and the population, um, both the organism and biological processes, and will therefore have both disciplinary effects and regulatory effects. <coughs> So he talks about medicine a little bit more in terms of knowledge and, and a science, and I'm also interested in how uh, the practices of refugee health care, of health professionals, is situated and um, located in between these different series, between states and institutions, um, and between bodies and populations as matters of concern. And I think assembly theory um, it offers some nice ways to to link these two series and to think about how they interact and how they relate in different contexts. So, I mean, clearly, assemblage thinking um, seems useful or relevant in a number of ways. Um, the assemblage is pretty heterogeneous. We're talking about bodies, health um, processes. Um, these bodies both play an expressive role, um, signs of torture, of age, um, a material role, uh, well being bear of infectious diseases and so forth. Um, they become an, a component in actually institutional decisions on citizenship or deportation and so forth. Um, and also they are interesting in the dependencies and positions between language and matter and materiality. So um, the role of interpreters is uh, critical for actually creating a diagnosis, for actually um, making sense of um, the body in um, examination processes and um, the availability of interpreters is a big issue because they are not usually paid by the, by the same institution than the healthcare itself. So you have to go to another institution to actually apply for getting an interpreter for, for example, um, also uh, psychotherapeutic treatment. But what I would like to focus now on is the concept of biopolitics and how um, Deleuze and Gattery and um, Samuel thinking may be helpful here. And a particular point where I think that might be useful is when they write on micropolitics and segmentarity. Um, because there they reconsider the relation or relations of micro and macro, molecular and molar, and the relations of state institutions and organizations and forms of um, power. So Deleuze and Gattari distinguish the rigid and a subtle form of segmentarity. Um, and they initially attribute that to um, state so societies, but the so-called primitive societies. Rigid segmentarity means that distinctions between who belongs where, between men, women, and so forth, um, originate in a single center, or at least resonate all in a uh, single center. Subtle segmentarity, in contrast, points to the possibility of multiple centers where distinctions are made, and different distinctions are made that then overlap and um, come to end up in certain organizations of who belongs to something. In my case, for example, is um, 
uh, has a legitimate um, desire of, of health treatment. So they themselves write, quote, in the rigid mode, binary segmentarity stands on its own and is governed by great machines of direct binaris binarization that origin in the state. Whereas in the other mode, binarities result from multiplicities of n dimensions. Secondly, they point also to state institutions and institutional contexts and argue that these do not necessarily follow a singular state logic. And that's also um, a part of, of, of my way has talked about uh, with regards to um, relations of exteriority. So the institutions are not exhausted by a state system or a state logic of governing um, refugee healthcare. There's flexibility in what practitioners do in the diagnoses they um, they create and in the way that they interact with um, different also state authorities. And that, so this, as Deleuze and Gattelie put it, there is that suddenness in, in every institution, also in modern state institutions. Um, there's a suddenness of off and communication between offices, bureaucratic perversion, permanent inventiveness or creativity practiced even against administrative regulations. And I wouldn't pose that as a definite analysis of the situation, but rather as something to look at. What are the flexibilities, what are the flexible spaces um, that um, health professionals use in their role at the interface of state or public institutions and uh, refugees? So biopolitics of refugee health then um, should be considered a multiplicity um, with an interaction of actors and logics of, of different variables that do not necessarily follow one singular logic. So if you take the, the metaphor of the knobs, it's not, there are several knobs, that's clear, um, but it's not one logic, one, one person or one imaginary person or rational that um, decides on how to position these knobs. Rather, there are different people at different places turning these knobs and producing different outcomes. What are the implications? First, I think then, uh, rather than talk about the biopolitical state of the society or of refugee healthcare in Germany, I think we're dealing with different biopolitical regimes or different phase states of biopolitics. Um, and these states tend to operate with different notions of population and different relations between individuals, subjects, and populations. So I, I try to draw that to see. Um, very rough sketch, you could say. It's a, an attempt to draw a face space of biopolitics. Um, and so, so the, the, the hard line here um, that you could see as maybe um, the European border regime and this security state distinction who's in and who's out. If you're beyond that, um, that line on the left, you're in a space where um, refugees are only considered in, in numbers, not as, not as subjects, not as individuals. Um, but as numbers of people trying to get to Europe as a number of deaths um, in the Mediterranean. But then there's a threshold that they cross when actually making it through the, um, that um, um, border security regime and make it to the, that circle which could be the camp, the reception camp. And here of course state security logics are still at play but they, they interfere and interact with um, other different logics, such as humanitarian logics, medical ethics, and so forth. Um, and also they sort of treat the individual differently in comparison to um, the majority um, population. So arriving at the reception center marks a change in the state of biopolitics. You pass a threshold. You become visible to the state with a history and with certain rights, but yet as a group you are still kept apart from the majority society in terms of economic participation, security, political participation, um, but also rights to have care and so forth. So it, the, the biopolitics there shifts the focus from policing the border to policing individual bodies and subjects in their relation to both the group of other migrants and the majority population. In healthcare, we are now dealing with public health, and um, the public of public health is no longer as clearly separated um, 
especially it has before. So the, also the, the public that the doctors talk about in public health is not as clearly distinguished between this the German population and this the migrant population. Um, it tends to dissolve also these binaries. Um, for example, by then emphasizing many of the people that I, I spoke to emphasize that um, migrants are not the ones posing a risk to a majority of society, but actually are the population at risk of infectious diseases, partially because of their um, accommodation in uh, such large reception centers. Are you finishing? I am finishing. Time out. Mm -hmm. So, um, second point, and I think that's already clear, is these phase states of biopolitics are not so much the result of a centralized planning, someone turning all the knobs and setting them all in one state, but um, different rationals are at work in different institutional settings, um, and the, the spatial setup of the initial reception center is a major point because it changes the way that also state authorities interact with medical personnel from the university clinic. On the other hand, the, the medical authority of the state is strictly institutionally and spatially separated from the university clinic. So the, the concern that people might be at risk to the majority population, the mandatory vaccination, um, are done elsewhere. So they do not, do not interact with the university clinic in the case of Freiburg. So to conclude, um, oh, this is another attempt to illustrate that, so that would be um, a center of resonance, like all the knobs being turned by a singular logic, and the second would be sort of a more rhizomatic biopolitics, where different logics interact, may resonate, may also conflict and interfere uh, with one another. To very briefly conclude then, um, ref biopolitics of ref refugee healthcare, I think, can be considered as a multiplicity of logics, actors, discourses and practices, and um, it, it operates on a micro and macro political um, level and should be considered as such. So, also, the empirical approach would have to consider what is actually happening in practices and how does that relate back to different um, uh, logics uh, that operate on other scales. Um, and importantly, I think biopolitics is not something that just belongs to a society and marks a state of a society, but can be considered as different regimes that differ in their treatment of the relation between individuals and groups, and also take different forms depending on um, the spatial setup in that case, for example, of these um, reception camps and even other. Thank you.